Okay, hello to everyone, wherever you are, and greetings uh, from Rome. Today I want to entertain you uh, for some time about the heart of the Hildebrand brother and their representation of Tolkien's world. And I will try to convince you of how deep are the roots of their heart in the traditional imaginary and in the classic art of the Middle Age. Uh, can we show the title? Okay. There we are. Almost there. Pardon. Okay. So the, the theme we are uh, speaking about today is Middle Age, Middle Earth, imaginary Middle Age. Um, in the images uh, of Tolkien's work by the brothers people. Um, if we speak of imaginary, of course, we are speaking about fantastic. And when I say fantastic, I mean uh, uh, legendary tales, mythical heroes, and especially, of course, fabulous monsters. All these has always been a part of the aesthetic, both of the Greek and of the Roman world. And with the advent of Middle Age, and particularly with the Romanesque and above all the Gothic period, this fantastic has also started to be a primary component of the cultural and spiritual life of Europe. What I am speaking of is that imaginary Middle Age, which is contemporary to the historical one, so well depicted by René Guénon and above all by the art historian Jurgis Baltrusaitis. This imaginary was a fundamental element and source of the historical one, with art and faith as the narration and symbols as the founding words. Uh, in order to start in the best possible way our short journey through the portrayal of Middle Earth by the Hildebrand brothers, we must keep in mind that this imaginary Middle Age we are speaking of, a lot more than the historic one, is the true source of all the literature that from the end of the 19th century, starting with William Morris, and to the present days, has given us hundreds of imaginary realms and heroes. The ideas, and I mean it in the platonic sense, uh, of knights, wizards, fairies, enchanted lands and waters, and all the beloved bestiary of fantasy, from griffons and unicorns to the inevitable dragons, all come from there, from this imaginary of Middle Age. Now, I think that few artists of the many who have tried to transform and narrate the mythical world of Tolkien through images have been more aware of this assumption than the brothers Hildebrand. I will try to show to you how much interwoven their visionary heart is with very precise details taken from the historical background and how much conscious references it includes from 13th to 15th century. So making a choice that probably even Professor Tolkien would have appreciated, let's start with Dreams. Do we start there? Sorry? Here we are. Let's start with dragons. Um, the most famous uh, dragon uh, in Tolkien world, as we know, is uh, Smaug. So nothing strange in the fact uh, that it is the most uh, recurring uh, in the heart uh, of the Hildebrand brothers. And there is no doubt uh, that the main source of inspiration for their heart uh, was the portrayal of uh, Smaug drawn by Tolkien himself in one of the most famous images he created to illustrate The Hobbit, 
we all know very well this image. But this doesn't lessen the relevance of the fact that also Tolkien Smaug, as well as the later dragons painted by the Hildebrand, is taken to the letter from the traditional fantastic art of historical Middle Age. And to be more precise, from that of the Gothic period. Uh, the monster of the underworld, the so-called chthonic monster, those uh, which represents the matter and the blackness of the primeval darkness against the immateriality of the light and of the spirit, against the light of the sun god, well, this kind of monster is a myth, ancient as the word itself. We found it in every mythology from Egypt, where the serpent Apophi fights uh, the sun god Ra, to Greece with the famous myth uh, of Apollo and the serpent. But indeed, till well into the Middle Age, Romanesque included, this creature of the darkness is a serpent, not a dragon. The image and the symbol of the flying monster with chiroptera wings, with bat wings, is a creation of the Gothic imagine, or better, an import by the Gothic of uh, a subject which was typical of the Far East art. So, Zmau Batwinged is an icon of that same Middle Age which gave us the alchemy, the Arthurian poems, and the Gothic cathedrals. Okay, now let's move quickly to what I call the team picture of the company, of the Fellowship of the Ring. Here too, we immediately get the sensation to be at the same time in a fantastic and in an historical Middle Age. Not so much from the clothes, apart from the capes, which are very typical, but especially from the shoes, for those who wear shoes, of course. Uh, Himli, uh, Legolas and Gandalf were traditional good English footwear from the 13th century, as you can easily find in the London Museum. And Boromir and Aragorn, as we know also thanks to other two famous illustrations of the Hildebrands, the return of Gandalf and the gift of Galadriel, uh, they were classic uh, splay boots, which was a typical uh, footwear of the 14th century in Europe. And now, let's go deeper. I want to show you this very touching image created by the Hildebrand brothers. This, as you well know, is the healing of the Uri. Now, you can easily see that the overall construction of this picture strongly recalls a very typical Middle Age iconography, that of the so-called so Dormitio Virginis, the sleep of the Virgin Mary. As we can, as an example, verify both by Giotto and by Andrea Mantegna, two great painters of the classic Middle Age. The same is even more true when we look at, at this other illustration of the Hildebrands. This is called, as you know, the crowning of Aragorn. And here we go back to a true and long iconographic medieval tradition that indeed of the crowning, not so much of the king in general, as that of the real holy emperor, which in history is, of course, Charles the Great. And on this item, a strong thread ties the miniatures of the codes of the 12th and 13th centuries, to the Greek frescoes of Raffaello, as you can contemplate in the Vatican Museum. Yesterday afternoon, I was in the Vatican Museums and I had a long, long look 
at uh, this uh, fresco by Raffaello. Uh, and I thought it was uh, an item of good luck to be there yesterday. Now, let's go, let's go on to the two final and most significant images to show what I mean when I speak of the representation of Tolkien world by the Hildebrand as an interpretation of that genuine medieval imaginary, which is the root of all the fantastic literature of the last three centuries. Let's start with the return of Gandalf. Here, Haragorn is holding a flaming sword. But even if the name Anduril, for the common knowledge, as we all know, means flame of the West, even if, to be very precise, in Kenya, real is uh, brilliance and not flame, Anyway, Andrew, as I was saying, is not literally a flaming sword. Uh, its blade is not made of living fire. And also in his uh, previous life as uh, Narsil, and in his sword of the Second Age, uh, the sword that in the, in the fantasy of Tolkien actually shines with light, but the blade is not literally flaming. So it's particularly telling that on the contrary, the flaming sword was a very strong symbol of medieval religiousness and holy images. It was the main object typifying the Archangel Michael. And this bought as a sword with a snaky blade, as you can see here, where the snaky form recalls a flame, and as the actually flaming blade of the angel as it appears in the great frescoes of European 15th century. Now let's turn to uh, Gandalf the White. Where do come from Gandalf's staff of the, uh, this image? Of course we know uh, that the walking staff is uh, a typical feature of Gandalf since the very first pages of the Hobbit. All that young suspecting Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. Ah, this is the first chapter and in the first lines of the Hobbit. So wrote Tolkien, and this why? Because, as Tom Shippe suggests, Tolkien thought that the right translation of the Icelandic word Gandr, the root word for the name Gandalf, which he took from the Vergatal of Snorri, as well as all the names of the twelve dwarves. Uh, the, true, the right translation of this uh, Icelandic word for Tolkien was staff. But the staff of Gandalf in this picture, let's go back. So uh, the staff of Gandalf in this picture. Um, so generally influenced by, as we have seen with the sword of Aragorn, by medieval elements and symbols. In this case, the stuff is only a byproduct of the creativity of the Hildebrands. Well, we don't know. We know that the stuff may not come from that very popular character, which a lot of people thought and maybe even thinks to be the very first model and inspiration for Gandalf. And of course, I'm speaking of Merlin the Wizard. It cannot be him because the medieval Merlin never had a walking staff as an attribute. We can search up and down through three centuries, from the 12th to the 15th century, and we will find no image of Merlin with a staff. So probably <clears throat> for such an important, let's say the most important element uh, of this picture, and in general, as far as Gandalf's staff is concerned, the Hildebrand relied only on their art and their fantasy. Or, I want to leave you on this point with a small doubt, just for the sake of open attitudes, 
Maybe they took into account that in the iconography of Middle Age, there was a very symbolic and important staff branded by a very symbolic and important character, which is Moses. And now a very last provocation. I, I know I'm aware that it's really a provocation before going on to another essential image. Contemplate just for the moment, we go very rapidly back. Okay, contemplate just for a moment uh, the, the, the image of the face uh, of Gandalf and the solemnity uh, of this uh, erratic attitude and especially his expression. Now, here we are. Don't you find, or better, don't you feel a connection with this Moses, the Moses by Michelangelo. Okay, now final and by far the most substantial example of what I've tried to demonstrate so far. I am speaking of the illustration called the gift of Galadriel. Here, the inspiration and the roots, I think, are almost paraded. The whole composition speaks by itself. Here, we are looking at a pagan, or if you prefer, a non-Christian, reinterpretation of one of the three most typical themes of the Middle Age iconography, together with the Nativity and the Crucifixion. And of course, I am speaking of Mary's Annunciation. I could show you a uh, hundred of examples, but I think that the three I have chosen are very telling. Let's start with this wonderful Annunciazione by Gentile da Fabriano. This is a picture of the 15th century, which is now in the Vatican Museums here in Rome. You can see by I of how the picture composition of one takes back to the other. That is self-evident. Uh, the same is even more obvious if you consider the very famous Annunciazione by Beato Angelico, always of the 15th century, which today is at the Prado Museum. But where things become, at least for me, almost astonishing, is when we look at the, the third picture, the Annunciazione by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Annunciazione painted between uh, 1472 and 1475, and now in the collection of the Uffizi Gallery. Here we don't have, I think, merely the general and traditional iconography of any Annunciazione. Here we have a more strong connection with what we have seen before. We have the gorgeous use of the landscape and, which is absolutely not uh, obvious when we are speaking of classic Middle Age art, the Virgin Mary is making with her, left, with her right hand an absolutely unconventional uh, movement, unconventional for what was uh, the traditional art of that period. And this is very like the um, Hildebrand illustration, an unconventional movement of her right hand. Okay, that's all folks. But let me leave you remembering that the unconventional gesture of Mary in this picture is due to the fact that she is turning a page of a mysterious book, as you can see. A page with an esoteric message, something uh, written in a never seen alphabet fully invented by Leonardo. And this is something I think that Professor Tolkien would have fully appreciated. Thanks for your attention. 
and I hope you enjoy this speech. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, so, if you have a question, can you please raise your hand and we will come along and find you and um, allow you to uh, share your question. We do have one that's just been popped up. Um, so, um, Alessandro, this is from um, Ash Ashlyn. Um, Tolkien's Smaug and also the Hildebrands has two wings plus four legs. Is there any medieval uh, representation of a dragon that has this characteristic? Uh, the dragons is uh, um, a, a creation, uh, as I was saying, of uh, the, fa the Middle Age fantastic of the last period, especially in the Gothic period. This is because the dragon as winged, but winged creature comes from the ancient Chinese art and uh, so entered in our uh, European tradition only uh, through the contact uh, between these, uh, these two cultures. All the time before, since the ancient times, uh, Sumer, uh, Babylonia, uh, Greece, uh, Rome, and the, even the Middle Age, up to the Romanesque itself, uh, the image of the monster which represented the darkness against the light, the, 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 the monster killed by the sun god, is always a serpent, is a, a, a earth creature. It cannot Oh, and it's, uh, there is a certain logic in this, because of course it represents matter, uh, weight, uh, darkness is, for, is strongly connected to the earth uh, as uh, uh, a counterpoint to the sky. So uh, there is a logic in the fact that it was a serpent, but uh, with the Gothic period, the Middle Age uh, create this new kind of monster, which is uh, evil, is uh, darkness against light, but is also flying with this wonderful and, and big uh, bat, uh, bat wings. And uh, as we saw, this became a, a very typical symbol uh, incorporated in the, in the Gothic cathedral all over Europe in the period. Okay, super. Um, Right. And one question for, uh, from Jira is, um, did the Hildebrand brothers have um, any specific technique of painting um, at all? Any techniques? Um, what I think is, uh, you, you can also look <laughs> just behind me at the image we choose uh, to have um, as, as a screen. Uh, they are very, very, very precise, almost uh, um, realistic in, in all the details. They represent, this is, this is what I love more of the Hildebrands. They represent a uh, fantastic work. They represent the world of Tolkien, which is uh, a product of the mythology. Uh, they even illustrated uh, other fantasy stories. So they, what they are represented is uh, the top of the imaginary, but is represented with details uh, of, uh, of a reality, an alternative reality, uh, which goes to uh, the, the, the small particular of, of the rocks or a harms that people like. This is uh, very, very uh, taken from, uh, also this is, uh, is strongly taken from how uh, classic medieval art was done with uh, thousands and thousands uh, of, of tiny particulars uh, represented uh, uh, in details. Uh, also, when showing something which was only in the fantasy of the artist, which, which is not really the representation of, of anything true. 